control of the Senate. The voters of Georgia have spoken in yesterday's runoff elections. We have results, reaction, and analysis. Certification challenge. Some Republican lawmakers are rejecting the results of the November presidential election. The Otis Nativity scene. We take you to a basilica in Rome and why it's part of history. And Blessing North America. A closer look at three saints whose feasts are this week and why they have something else in common. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, January 6th, 2021. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. We begin tonight with Congress forced into a lockdown and lawmakers sheltering in place in the wake of supporters of President Donald Trump breaking into the U.S. Capitol building, forcing a delay in the certification of the Electoral College. Protesters stormed the barricades outside of the building and got into the Capitol building. They got into Statuary Hall and even made it onto the floor of the Senate. There was also a report of shots fired. The mayor of D.C. has ordered a curfew in the nation's capital from 6 tonight until 6 tomorrow night. President Donald Trump is calling the National Guard and federal officers to respond to the Capitol building. White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany begs protesters to remain peaceful. This after Republican lawmakers issued a formal challenge to the presidential election results during a joint session of Congress. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, good evening to you on what's been a very troubling and disturbing day here in Washington, D.C. Earlier, President Donald Trump encouraged his supporters to march to the Capitol. Instead, some went through the Capitol, causing chaos. There were violent clashes. And the National Guard, as you mentioned, has been called in. And just a little earlier, I want to read it right off my phone here. President Trump tweeted, I'm asking for everyone at the U.S. Capitol to remain peaceful. No violence. Remember, we are the party of law and order. Please support our Capitol Police and law enforcement. They are truly on the side of our country. Stay peaceful. President Donald Trump's supporters today storming the nation's capital, flooding the Capitol steps and breaching the building itself, forcing a delay in the constitutional process to affirm President-elect Joe Biden's victory in the November election. The march down the National Mall spurred on by President Trump at a rally near the White House. We beat him four years ago. We surprised him. We took him by surprise. And this year, they rigged an election. They rigged it like they've never rigged an election before. The president vows to never back down. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. Before all the chaos erupted, Congress convened in a joint session to review the presidential election results. The two houses will withdraw from joint session. Each house will deliberate separately on the pending objection. Certifying the Electoral College is often a formality. But this year, many Republicans objected. Why not one single investigation? Why not even one single hearing over the last nine weeks in the United States House of Representatives? Why? Because all the Democrats care about is making sure President Trump isn't president. The challenges claim some states mishandled the election. Others allege fraud, even though most of those cases have been investigated and dismissed. Democrats denounce Republicans for challenging the presidential election results. This election were overturned by mere allegations from the losing side, our democracy would enter a death spiral. They assure America that President-elect Joe Biden will be sworn in as president on January 20th, Inauguration Day. I understand the disappointment people feel when their candidate for president loses. I have felt the same several times in my voting life. When that happens, it's not an invitation to upend the Constitution and the laws of the United States. For now, the peaceful transition of power is on hold, and a curfew is in effect this evening in the nation's capital. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly.
Thank you, Owen. Well, John Malcolm, Vice President of the Institute for Constitutional Government at the Heritage Foundation, joins me now on Skype to talk more about what we're seeing today on Capitol Hill. John, welcome back. Always good to have you on the show. Uh, help us put today into perspective and its significance, beginning with the objections to the certification of President-elect Joe Biden and his win, and also the protests that followed. Well, what's going on at the Capitol at the moment is indeed deeply disturbing. I mean, there are reports that a woman is in critical condition, having been shot on Capitol grounds, and some of the protesters that are inside the Capitol are armed. This is a very, very dangerous situation. In terms of what was happening on, uh, on the House and Senate floor, it's certainly unusual, but there is precedent uh, for it. So there is a statute, the Electoral Count Act, of 1887 that sets forth a procedure by which congressmen can challenge the certification uh, of electors from any given state. What that statute essentially says is that if a congressman, a, a member of the House of Representatives, and a United States senator in writing uh, object to the certification from any particular state, uh, that they are supposed to interrupt the joint proceedings and go to the separate ways, one to the House, one to the Senate, where they have two hours of debate on that issue, and then they take a vote about whether to accept that challenge uh, or to uh, accept the certified electors that were forwarded uh, to the Senate to be counted and go on uh, from, from there. They had gotten as far as Arizona uh, when uh, a congressman from Arizona and Senator Ted Cruz uh, had submitted that writing, and they were having that debate. Uh, when all of this got, uh, got interrupted. It's very, very difficult to overturn a certification. A majority of both the House and the Senate have to vote to you know, accept the challenge uh, and to overturn the electors that were certified from that state. So at the end of the day, you know, this, this will delay things. It will make for very dramatic theater, hopefully peaceful from now on. Uh, but you know, I don't think it's going to change the outcome of anything. Yeah, and John, as you know, before the unrest began, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell expressed his opposition to today's challenge. Some are pointing to that as a sign of division within the Republican Party. What are your thoughts on that, and, and how do you think the rhetoric that we've been hearing uh, has affected Americans' confidence in the integrity of the nation's elections as well? Well, I think the, the confidence of the American people has shaken, been shaken a lot, but you know, not, even, not necessarily by... Rhetoric. So you have roughly 40 percent of the people in this country either agree or agree strongly uh, that the outcome of this election was not legitimate. Uh, you know, there are certainly are a lot of vulnerabilities in our election system. And I think it's important that those be addressed uh, primarily in the state legislatures of all of the, the states. They ought to look at how we conduct their elections and plug some of those vulnerabilities that exist. Uh, but I think what's going on in the House and Senate is a reflection of the fact that the conservatives are divided. There are people who believe that, you know, we lost the election, but it's time to move on and to keep fighting, particularly now since it looks like the Democrats will keep, they will keep the House and have effective control uh, of the Senate. And there are other people who are part of so-called MAGA nation, uh, who believe that this election was stolen, and they are mad as hornets. And unfortunately, unfortunately, today, we're seeing that some of them are resorting to violence. Now, John, I uh, wish we had more time to talk to you, but we're going to have to leave it right there. Thanks so much for coming on today. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Uh, Democrats have won a pivotal U.S. Senate seat in Georgia, and they appear to be closing in on another at this hour. That second race is too close to call, but confirmed wins in both Senate runoff races in Georgia would mean Democrats gain complete control in the nation's capital. Let's go right to correspondent Mark Irons, who has the latest. Mark. Tracy, what's happening right now in Georgia has everything to do with holding all the power right here in Washington. President-elect Joe Biden has won the White House. Democrats hold the House of Representatives. And with two more victories, they will control the U.S. Senate. I thank the people of Georgia for electing me to serve you in the United States Senate. Thank you. Senate Democratic candidate John Ossoff this morning claiming victory in the Georgia race he currently leads against incumbent Senator David Perdue. Votes are still being counted, but the damage to Republicans has already been done. What happened last night is stunning. Democrat Raphael Warnock, a Baptist pastor, winning his race over Republican Senator Kelly Loeffler. Georgia, historically a conservative stronghold. We flipped a state, and it took a lot of hands to do that. 
is the result of giving people their voice, quite frankly. At this point, Senator Leffler is not conceding the race. This is a game of inches. We're going to win this election. We're going to save this country. Two Democratic wins in Georgia will impact lawmaking in the nation's capital. The U.S. Senate would be split 50-50, but Vice President-elect Kamala Harris would be a tie-breaking vote, meaning Democrats hold the power. As majority leader, President Biden and Vice President-elect Harris will have a partner in me. Senator Chuck Schumer believing he will soon become majority leader. For too long, much needed help has been stalled or diluted by a Republican-led Senate and President Trump. That will change with a Democratic Senate, a Democratic House, and a Democratic President. We're also hearing from Senator David Perdue, who is in that too close to call race with Democrat John Ossoff. He says, we will mobilize every available resource and exhaust every legal recourse to ensure all legally cast ballots are properly counted. In the studio, Mark Irons, EWTN News Nightly. Well, Vince Colonna is editorial director at The Daily Caller, joins me now by Sky Vince. Good to see you. Welcome back. Um, I want to start you. off uh, by getting your reaction to what we're seeing today in Washington. Uh, tell us what you're seeing right now, what you're thinking. I'm just thinking that the trust in our institutions is rock bottom. And you see violence today uh, on the Capitol, but it's not the first act of violence that we've seen, especially over the course of the past year. We've seen too much violence in American cities across the country, and it doesn't seem to fix itself now to any political party, it, and it all involves a lack of trust in institutions, whether it was the riots we saw over the summer where there was a uh, lack of trust in law enforcement, uh, uh, rightly or wrongly, and again, now a lack of trust in our, in our uh, election system, and it's manifesting itself in some cases in violence. It's very deeply troubling, and it's a warning sign to the leaders, I think, of our country that they need to instill trust in all of the citizens of this country at every level. So if you are in a position of power, whether it be in the media or in politics or in business, you have a responsibility to your fellow American to convince them that you are acting uh, with, with their interests at heart and actually care about this country. I hope this is a wake-up call for everyone. Vince, uh, I want to turn now back to the Georgia elections. I know you followed these races very closely. What happened, and, and what do you think factored into Reverend Warnock's win there? Well, I think a couple of things. One is goes back to my prior point, which is diminished trust. You know, when we had a race that you know everyone knew, you you we've talked about this, that was so close going into election day, when it was actually a toss-up whether or not the Republican or the Democrat candidates would win in this race, you can't lose any support. You can't diminish your turnout at all because every vote counts. And unfortunately for Republicans, there was mistrust sown about whether or not the elections were even worth voting in. There was some skepticism about that by maybe a, maybe a small fraction of Georgia voters, but enough to make it so that Democrats were positioned to win that race. And I think it's going to be, you know, usually right in the wake of something like this, it's a little hard to assess exactly why it all went down. But I can't imagine that convincing voters not even to show up to vote was a helpful election strategy in any way for Republicans. Vince, what do you think the takeaways here are for the GOP? Uh, the GOP is going to have to focus on earning the trust of its voters and obviously getting them to turn out to vote. That's essential. And then figuring out ways to restore confidence in institutions. Those are, I think, the, the primary things. And that's not just a Republican message, by the way. I think that's a Democrat message, too. The only way we can move forward as a country is if we have trust in these institutions. So um, Republicans here, they're going to have to figure out a way to prevent um, Democrats from using their pretty incredible power that, they're now, that they've now obtained uh, from, you know, locking that power in permanently. Democrats have an opportunity here, if they seize it, to try and create new states, a permanent Democrat majority in the United States Senate, especially if it's places like Puerto Rico and Washington, D.C., which would be expected to create uh, Democrat senators for many years to come. Uh, concerns about getting rid of the filibuster and destroying any minority opinion, that is, any political minority opinion, from having an, an opportunity to be aired out in the United States Senate. And then, of course, the concerns about whether or not the Supreme Court gets packed um, with justices for political reasons rather than merit-based judicial ones. Those are all the things to be on guard for 
Republicans have a tall task ahead of them trying to stop those things from occurring. All right, Vince. And we were hearing that uh, John Ossoff has just been declared the winner. Quickly, your thoughts on that. It's consistent with what we expected today. He seemed to have, to the extent that votes were undercounted so far, they were in areas that favored John Ossoff. Now, uh, with that call, that's just confirmation uh, that he has enough clearance to be able to be declared victor by the media. We'll see when the final tallies are all in, but it looks like at this point, two new Democrat senators out of Georgia, the first time that's happened since 2000 that a Democrat was elected to Senate in that state. All right, Vince, thank you so much. We're going to have to wrap it up. I always appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Good to be here. Coming up, Pope Francis celebrates Mass on the Feast of the Epiphany. And we take you to what is believed to be the oldest nativity scene in the world. Orthodox Christians celebrate Christmas tomorrow and Russians are preparing for the big day. This morning, Orthodox Christians in Moscow attended services at the Church of St. Tatiana. The rector says the church is big enough for everyone to keep their distance from each other. Orthodox Christians celebrate Christmas later because of the differences between the Julian and the Gregorian calendars. In Bulgaria, Orthodox Christians celebrate Epiphany with the traditional retrieval of the cross in icy cold water. In ceremonies commemorating the baptism of Jesus, every year young men jump into rivers and lakes across Bulgaria to get a crucifix that's tossed by a priest. Pope Francis calls for Christians to devote more time in adoration, looking at the three kings as an example. Celebrating Epiphany Mass in St. Peter's Basilica, the Holy Father says that we must lift our eyes to the Lord. Faith is not a required skill, but a journey to God who loves us. He will renew our strength and our joy. On today's Feast of the Epiphany, EWTN News Rome correspondent Colin Flynn brings us to the place where the oldest nativity statues in history are found. The Roman Basilica of St. Mary Major is home to the oldest known nativity statues in all of history. After St. Francis created the first nativity in 1223, with no statues but as a live enactment of the story of Jesus' birth, the desire to portray the nativity soon spread. Nearly 70 years later, the first Franciscan Pope, Nicholas IV, commissioned statues from Italian artist Arnolfo di Cambio to represent the nativity scene. In questo caso, Arnolfo di Cambio realizza... Professor Santa Guido, a Roman restorer and art historian, brings us inside the basilica, where these original sculptures are now kept at the altar of St. Jerome. Non sappiamo quante... Guido says Arnolfo di Cambio didn't know how many figures made up a nativity scene, so he decided to sculpt statues of the main figures found in the Bible, Mary with the child Jesus, Saint Joseph, the ox and donkey, and the three kings. Two of the kings appear to be speaking to each other, finding themselves in front of the Lord after a long journey. The third king is on his knees in prayer after offering his gift to baby Jesus. The Mary with Child is not the original sculpted statue, however. Fifteen years ago, the statues were moved from the basilica to be restored, and it was discovered that the statue of Our Lady with baby Jesus had been re-sculpted in the 16th century. Guido says the image was originally a modern image and changed it in an effort to preserve the sacredness of the figure that was thought to be damaged. The initial location for this nativity scene was inside this tiny hidden chapel dedicated to the nativity. And on December the 8th of 2020, Pope Francis celebrated Mass there on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Ever since the oldest nativity sculptures at St. Mary Major were on display, the tradition of creating the creche in all shapes and sizes has spread throughout the world. In Rome, Colum Flynn, EWTN News Nightly. 
Operation Iraq says an ancient monastery is empty because of the coronavirus pandemic. The monastery of St. Hormizd is run by Chaldean Catholic Church and dates back to the 7th century. It was carved out of a mountain and thousands of tourists usually visit every year, but only a few have come since the coronavirus pandemic started. Up next, we examine the three North American saints whose feasts are celebrated this week. New York Cardinal Timothy Dolan says the radicals who defaced St. Patrick's Cathedral on New Year's are, quote, pure bigots. He wrote an op-ed in the New York Post saying that he did not speak out when the cathedral was defaced over the summer, but he is now denouncing the vandalism after more graffiti attacking the church and the police was spray-painted on January 1st. The outspoken Chicago priest, Father Michael Flager, faces an allegation that he sexually abused a minor over 40 years ago. Cardinal Blaise Supich of Chicago says the claims against Father Flager seen here have not been proven true or false at or under investigation. The priest has served at St. Sabina Church on Chicago's south side since 1983. All this week, the church is honoring three North American saints. Monday was the feast of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. Yesterday, the feast day of St. John Newman. And today is the feast of St. Andre Bessette. Joining us now to talk more about these three saints is Dr. Matthew Bunsen, executive editor and the Washington bureau chief for EWTN News. Matthew, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, let's start with Monday's feast of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. What can you tell us about her? Well, when we think of the towering figures in the history of uh, American Catholic history, uh, Elizabeth Ann Seton stands among the giants. Uh, when we think of uh, Archbishop John Carroll, for example, the first bishop, uh, she is right there with him. I say that for two reasons. One, she, in her lifetime, helped establish the great Catholic school system that went on uh, to become almost a legend in Catholic history. She established uh, one of the first of the great congregations of women in the United States. But she's also a role model for all of us today in the way that in her lifetime, uh, she endured great losses and yet loved the church. Uh, it was a convert to the church from Episcopalianism and uh, was a willing defender of the church uh, through her, her simple holiness of life. And the gift of her life is something that we salute today. And yesterday, uh, the church honored St. John Newman. He was born in the U.S., but he immigrated here. Tell us more about him. Well, that's right. Uh, he was born in what was then Bohemia, which would be uh, today part of the Czech Republic, uh, called uh, to the priesthood. Uh, he had hoped to be ordained in his native country, but instead was drawn to the missions and turned his eye to America, uh, the United States in particular. And when he arrived, he was ordained and went out to become a great evangelist, a great missionary priest. Uh, it is said that uh, he joked that the Niagara Falls uh, was his baptismal font, because he wandered from Germany. Catholic community to other communities across uh, New York and into uh, other Pennsylvania and other states. The other thing, too, about him is that he served for eight years or so as the Bishop of Philadelphia. And at building on the work of Elizabeth Ann Seton, uh, he grew the Catholic schools there from about one to 200 by his untimely death in 1860 at only the age of 48. So John Neponimacine Neumann, or Newman, uh, is another one of those great figures who, much like Elizabeth Ann Seton, anticipated the phenomenal growth of the church in a time, again, of pretty severe anti-Catholicism when Catholics simply weren't welcome. And quickly, uh, let's talk about today, the feast day of St. Andre Bessette, more of a modern day saint, I guess you could say. What can you tell us about him? He died in 1937 at the age of 91. He was a lay brother of, uh, just a simple lay brother in Canada, uh, with the Congregation of the Holy Cross. It was said that when he was drawn to the religious life, uh, his pastor sent him to the congregation with the simple word, I am sending you a saint. He was a porter for 40 years, but he's especially known for his devotion and love uh, to St. Joseph. And it was through his work and inspiration that the magnificent oratory of St. Joseph was built, what is today a basilica visited by millions of people. So all three of these saints, great saints of North America, tell us, teach us uh, how to live 
holiness in our own era, how to bring people together to touch lives. I think their message is something that we all need to hear, especially right now at a time of great political and social division. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Bunsen, for coming on and sharing all of that with us. We appreciate it. Good to be with you. And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.